my name is Dr. Alexei Heinz. I'm one of the co-editors uh, of uh, the Digital and Social Media Marketing book. And uh, this is the final webinar that we are going to use today to launch. And uh, in the current context of the COVID-19 crisis, we have an amazing panel today. We will really share with you some interesting insights and uh, help you to understand the world that we are all facing. So we've got Tim Stewart, Edward Delord, Christopher Hackett, Fernando Angulo and McFarl Osborne. And here is a congratulations to our last uh, webinar's winner, Sarana Oana Philip, who won the best question competition on the 6th of May webinar. So well done, Sarana. Just to remind you, the key concept uh, that is being proposed by this digital and social media marketing book is the buyer persona spring, which is the heart or the core of a digital marketing strategy. So the first uh, webinar, we talked about the content that we would need to share in the current context. We then talked about the channels in the second webinar. And today we are really focusing on data and the exciting things that data shows us to really make that digital marketing strategy that bit more precise and far more focused. And really this is the bit that makes digital marketing sort of digital marketing. I would like to introduce you to our first panelist uh, who has uh, been working for the, in the industry for over 20 years. He's been planning, selling and delivering uh, compelling commercial solutions for both B2C and B2B, both online and offline. And he's currently providing client and project work through his own business optimization consultancy, TRS Digital Limited. So over to you, Tim. I deal with a lot of data. My main specialism is in conversion optimization. And certainly the changes we've seen over the last few months have made a big difference in that side of the market. The main thing which people seem to do, the reaction they seem to do was to, to stop Things have changed. We don't know. All our previous data is lost. Therefore, it doesn't apply to right now. And people have been a bit lost. And I've been kind of explaining it a little bit like the sort of the five stages of grief or loss is that initially people have been in denial. They've not really looked at anything other than what they've no longer got. And they can't believe that. And some carried on as before, but they have not uh, had the world in which. That would work anymore at that point then they started getting angry they started kind of going well this isn't fair i want it to be like it used to be and then they start bargaining looking uh, looking at ways they can make that fit and whilst this is how my clients have been reacting this has been their business plans for the year all gone out the window this is also actually how the users have been reacting so their buying patterns their behavior their income how much free time they've got has all shifted drastically. And that's following on from this realization, once you kind of get to the point, there's become kind of almost a depression. This won't be the same again. We're not sure. And I think we've, we are starting to move into now the stage where people are, are accepting a, a new normal, even give it a name. So, what can a business do in this period is accept that the data you had is no longer appropriate to the current markets but also accept that therefore there is new data. And so the activity you're doing now, the activity you're planning for, will be fed by new information. So you should be looking in more detail at your analytics. If you have seen strange buying patterns, and these have, they've been strange initially, and we're in that kind of denial stage because they just weren't the targets we wanted to hit this year. But actually, if we follow the last couple of months worth of changes, we've seen these patterns change from uh, emergency kind of uh, panic buying um, high volume stuff into more kind of like well let me rethink let me prepare more considered purchases and I know, I know Fernando's on the call we've, we've seen some good research from people at SEMrush where they've shown that their online e-commerce and in, uh, buy online and pick up in store or buy online and click and collect has actually increased in terms of volume in certain areas because there are people who've never bought before online. There are people who would have perhaps had a preference to buy at retail who are now using the online channel. So not only do we have our existing customer base who are behaving differently, we've also got a whole bunch of brand new people coming in. So we need to rethink, as you obviously mentioned at the start, we've got kind of personas. We need to rethink our personas. But rather than maybe having a, a persona set that is um, kind of your classic kind of stereotype, this is Barbie's 35 years old, they're no longer 
Bob who's 35 year old. It could be five Bobs. One Bob is currently sitting in the denial stage. The other Bob is in depression stage. The other one's in the anger stage. They've got different pulls on their needs. They may be furloughed. They may be working from home. They may be doing well in their business. They may be super busy. They may be have massive amounts of free time. So the classification for how we've decided to find these personas for the current period can actually be informed by the data. If you've got pages on the site, if you've got products which suit a certain type of need, if it's more of a an impulse purchase, if it's more of a free time purchase, a leisure purchase, these tell you what proportion of your audience are at which stage in this process. You can already start to segment the groups and you can see how those groups and their behavior on their visits change over time. And if it's proving harder or easier to get those on paid search, um, we're starting to see the paid search market come back a bit stronger. So whereas a lot of people just stop spend, some didn't, their competition is now starting to come back in. And the ones who refined where they were at during this period, who took time to relook at their data and their situation, are better armed than the people who stopped or didn't have the staff on to, to do that. So we're actually going to enter into a period of quite a bit of turmoil. And I think if you've got a decent idea of who your audience used to be and you've started to look at what the audience is now, you can start to map and start to make models to go, what would my old audience plus a degree of new people look like with these new personas? And I think we're going to see some patterns which are going to be more <coughs> conscious of other things. In Conversion optimization, we classically talk about kind of like trust signals. And we, but we're now at the point where I think things like um, hygiene, I think things like you know, contactless drop off are actually going to become things where people are important. But right now, it's much more practical. You know, can I deliver? So the kind of main thing is whatever you're compromised to right now, tell the customers. If you can't deliver on your normal term, deliver say we've got a five-day delivery explain why when that improves email out to tell why the best thing you can do is keep them informed and that's where we're at now in the transition phase but i think whilst we're in this period i think businesses should be looking more closely at their data to see what's shifted and what opportunities they've got within the new version of the truth because we have got these people going through the cycle and businesses are doing the same we're there Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Tim. So that was interesting to obviously pick up on the overall trends and the idea that the audiences have changed. So identifying new trust points or pain points that your customers might be facing and uh, obviously identifying potentially new customers and uh, new audiences as well. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. So uh, we will now uh, go over to our uh, second speaker, uh, that is uh, Edouard uh, Bellou, who is the man Managing Director for Accenture in France. And he's particularly focusing at automation and artificial intelligence, and he's been doing it for over 30 years. Over to you, Edouard. Thank you. For, for today, I mean, the objective was to take a concrete example of data usage and the potential commercial impact in order to illustrate your, your book. Uh, basically, what we see on the market is that emerging technologies like 5Gs, augmented reality and data have the potential to make custom experience for clients and boost commercial results. So the, my objective was to speak to you about the McDonald case, where basically the, the company is rolling out digital ordering kiosks across the US. The objective of that is really to enhance the customer experience. And in order to do so, McDonald is using three types of data. The first type is the, their own internal data knowledge, where they are using past purchases from customers, for instance, in order to uh, get from the analysis of all those internal data, uh, adapted recommendation for their clients. The second type of data is uh, for them to use external data sets, meaning uh, some weather forecasts, for instance, and these will allow them to promote uh, the best product depending on the weather outside and when uh, the weather is out, then propose Sundays or, or whatever. The third type of data I wanted to point out in this uh, uh, scenario is basically uh, the decision that has been taken by McDonald 
to base their uh, analysis on human knowledge. And this is to me the most important one. Basically, McDonald has decided to introduce a cooperative element that gives employees more control uh, over their workplace and the way they're going to manage their restaurant. Therefore, employees have the freedom to change many displays. So all the collected data gives us recommendation, but at the end of the day, the user and the, the employee itself can change it looking at the area of the restaurant, looking at uh, local circumstances, and decide, for instance, to promote some uh, easy-to-cook item in order to uh, ease the burden on them and to reduce the restaurant operations. This is, to me, the, the point. They are coupling three types of data, internal, external, and human data. They are positioning their own employee as an active and necessary contributor to the experience. And this is, a, to me, a powerful shift from the norm, and especially in marketing combination of three data sets actually fits into the uh, sort of decision making and the menu generation so focusing on obviously the internal external and the human uh, intervention obviously in terms of the demand that the audience is facing so thank you for, for that contribution to our third speaker who has been uh, working in the digital marketing industry for over seven years and uh, christopher hackett is uh, taking a more technical view of the world thank you so at seventh minute, we work to combine uh, data moments and technology for automated advertising actions. Our uh, focus is predominantly on mass events and um, the likes of TV broadcasting, sports events, weather, etc. Obviously, quite a handful of those have disappeared um, in the current situation. Overall, it's without saying the current crisis is the sub most substantial moment in digital marketing since its emergence. What we've seen on our platform since the topic arrived in January, um, it already surpassed all existing topics in February, and then in April had more coverage than Brexit, Trump, Boris, um, Iraq, Iran, and um, Australia wildfires combined. At the end of April, actually, it had twice as much uh, coverage as those items combined. Whilst the specific situation was unforeseen, we're fortunate to have some of the most responsive delivery mechanisms marketers can use. They're highly configurable and in an ecosystem of tools. And we've got the ability to have rapid reporting and fast reporting, giving both insight and accountability. It's we're more we're the most prepared we've ever been. We just need to use these tools. Um, on the actual um, delivery mechanisms, we've already seen that sizable changes in budgets, et cetera, have been applied. Um, those have been um, deployed with small lead times between the decision and the actual action being taken. It means that we can reverse those and we can put the, we can make changes um, on the fly and in a much more agile approach. With the ecosystem of tools, we can review, experiment, and take action based on the data that we're seeing. Um, can use a size of spend that matches the brand and sector's appetite for risk. Some, some uh, retail operations are operating at full capacity or beyond full capacity and others are just closed. So we can take a real agile style of marketing specific to individual brands and customers. On the actual reporting, the turnaround of the reporting is really important because the situation is really dynamic. What was delivering results two weeks ago might not deliver results today and vice versa. What wasn't delivering or couldn't deliver results two weeks ago might be an appropriate strategy for now as the environment is constantly changing. Long-term automation will be an effective response um, to this. Currently, already, we already have a high level of country, region, and other kind of variations in the response. For example, in the UK, two meters is a social distancing measure taken, whereas across in, in different locations that can be 1.5, one meter, or even six feet. The restrictions on goods and services for trading are different in all these locations. Even in the UK, in each of the nations, there's different restrictions. And the, even the classification of those across countries is different. Over time, this is likely to become more divergent. On the actual inputs we need to consider, um, as time goes on, the social and economical changes um, 
economic changes um, will be different. Some of these will be less obvious and binary as the current situation. Finally, um, as well as workplaces physically adapting, employers need to consider protections beyond uh, the physical health. Be alert, control the virus, the UK public service um, slogan um, will have, have a mental toll. Delegating where possible to set and forget automated actions will have substantial benefits to the workplace. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Chris. So obviously, it's uh, some interesting insights in terms of the into, uh, well, the information and the need to obviously adjust and uh, obviously continue the situation sort of monitoring process as well. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and uh, over to our next uh, contribution from Fernando Ancula, who is currently head of uh, communications uh, uh, at uh, SEM Rush and a digital marketing software company with search engine optimization and search engine marketing as its uh, core target and uh, is actively involved in the search marketing world and is a regular speaker at uh, digital marketing at uh, e-commerce conferences and events worldwide. So over to you, Fernando. Thank you very much, Alexei. Hello, everyone. Let's start with the overview. What type of data is available for you? Uh, what you what you can do with the data that you own? And of course, how to uh, make that da data actionable for you to uh, act, to take decisions, and of course, to make your online visibility these days uh, more, more um, to take it to the net, to take it to the next level. You need to look to data um, part by part as an overall, and you need to look for patterns. Uh, some of the some of uh, that data can be um, acquired or you can just retrieve your, your own data. But of course, specifically with the, with the use of tools like uh, SEMrush or any others on, in, the, in the market, you can have a look all, to all the data that you have for your own website or for your competitors. So let's start looking into organic search because that's our, our favorite part. If we're taking a look into the results, so we just need to identify three main question these days for every business, the new ones and the old ones. The first question is, what is? And it, this is gonna be a keyword, right? So what is, and then the name of your uh, business, the name of your product, the, the name of your service. The second question is how to use, how to use your product, how to use uh, your services. And the last question is, where is? Uh, so basically the location of your offices, uh, your restaurant, whatever is your location. Um, so you have these three questions. Uh, what is, uh, how to use it, and where is, and then you need to identify the feature snippets opportunities. Why is that? Because these are, these are, uh, this type of results are everywhere uh, on the search right now, and mainly when you are uh, answering these three questions, you're going to have those for your own um, products or services. So you need to have them built on your website. And you need to check, for example, with this tool called um, organic research, you just check if you already have those or maybe your competitors are having those. So in organic research, check if you have already the um, feature snippet for, then you need to check how many uh, backlinks you have. So what is the SEO potential that you have? And of course, where those backlinks are going. And, and if you are, if you want to compare you with your uh, online competitors, you need to check, of course, the profile that you have in comparison with your competitors and check the sources where those backlinks are going. So basically compare uh, your backlink profile with your competitors these days, that's really important for, for this SEO potential. So here you can see um, how is the structure internally of your website. And you can check, of course, how um, the uh, internal uh, linking, how the overall performance of the website is going with this health score. So a health score is measuring all the data that a tool like SEMrush is, um, is gathering from your website and is giving you a scoring uh, that is telling you, okay, your online visibility is not doing well. You need to improve here, here. And of course, you can check the um, online score from your competitors as well. And of course, here you can see 
uh, what exactly is happening with your audience. They are entering from different sources, right? But you need to check, they are coming from uh, Google, they are coming from social media, they are coming from an um, affiliate website, from, from partners, and then they're visiting your website, and then where they are going after that. They're, they're going to uh, a third uh, partner, they are going to, uh, again, Google to search for a different products or service, services. So you need to learn about the path of your customer where they are coming from, what they are doing in your website, and where they are going next. If they are going to, after to, uh, checking your uh, your business, they are going to your competitors, that's not a good thing, right? So you need to check that as well. And to improve that with, uh, for example, the uh, audience overlap and the traffic journey for your audience. Social media, let's take a look a little bit on the social media. What do you need to check here? You need to check uh, three things. First, audience overall. You have the right audience, you have audience at least, uh, how active the people uh, that are following you on social media are and how engaged they are. So three basic metrics that are really used, uh, easy uh, to measure. Next one is um, how good uh, they are uh, posting, how their posts are affecting uh, people in terms of engagement. Uh, they are doing something uh, good with their design team. They have a design team. They are posting. How often they are posting? What is the timing that they are uh, having more more, more expo exposure? So checking uh, what competitors are doing online. That's a really really great thing. And the last thing, of course, is what to do in this current situation because we have I sh shown you uh, six different features. But let's go with the most interesting one for the current situation. So first. Take a look on the trends. What is happening overall? What is the price of the keywords? Because some of the industry at the beginning of March were uh, beating the records in terms of price per keywords. For example, the health industry. Um, we have the retail e-commerce industry overall that was growing really, really fast. But some others, the price of their keywords were uh, uh, falling down really fast. For example, real estate was uh, really down there. The hospitality industry, and of course, with tools like CPC Map, you can check the prices of the keywords overall, and this is live uh, data. I, one of the suggestions here that I want to give you uh, to have really good results and very fast is to add the trust uh, pilot schema to your uh, snippets. Why is that? Because as uh, Tim mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, trust is a great factor. And of course, if you show that on the first page of the result, that's something really important to, to have, to have more visibility and trust from the users. And of course, with tools like, um, for example, our main uh, domain research, you can check how fast uh, your competitors are growing in, in terms of traffic and you can extrapolate, of course, uh, there can be a, a correlation between the funding cycle that they have. They are the first round, second round, third round, and the traffic grow because they're going to be open in different uh, channels of uh, promotion. And there you can see how fast they are growing. For example, here we have uh, the Monday.com uh, example when they they have their, their two funds, how big they, uh, they went up after it. And last one is, of course, we need to check their mistakes. Um, with this tool, for example, um, this is the uh, CPC, uh, PPC um, campaigns, uh, the, the PPC copies. Here you can see how good they are uh, entering their keywords for their own campaigns. And with this example that I'm giving you here uh, as well from a company that we love a lot, that is monday.com, uh, they are entering not necessarily the, the keywords that they need, they are entering something else uh, that they don't need. So they are doing that automatically without any knowledge. So you need to check on that as well. You have the data, you need to check on it. And uh, final thoughts, uh, understanding how good is your audience using all the data that I just uh, showed you, uh, the audience, um, the, how good are their website, and of course, understanding who they are, creating the buyer persona profiles and activating, just having the knowledge about who they are, uh, activating next, uh, all the data insights to uh, build your own uh, your own buying cycle. For example, for the awareness, consideration, and the decision uh, processes here, you need to have, okay, for the awareness, I'm gonna use all social media or articles with, with the consideration. I need to create more um, 
answer and um, questions and, and answer content and for decisions of course i need to do something else to make uh, to make them um do something on, on my website so take a look on all the data that you have available and create your uh, buying stage for every customer. Brilliant. Th thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, it's obviously great to see how powerful SEM Brush tool is becoming as, as for most marketers. So you can actually get both search and social data insights to inform your buyer persona understanding. And thank you, Fernando, for giving us some insights into the key features of uh, some of the tools that you have there. So now we are going over to a social chain. So Mechwal is the head of data at uh, Social Chain, which is uh, one of the world's largest uh, social media agencies. And he is uh, with us to share some of the social <laughs> insights and identity emerging mega trends during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Mekwal. Thanks so much. Um, and yeah, uh, fantastic introduction. And, and I just want to say it's been a, a, an honor just being um, able to listen to everyone here. So Fernando, I'm a big fan of SEMrush and, and everyone else that's shared uh, ahead of me. This has been uh, really eye-opening to me because a lot of what we spend time doing uh, with, with data and insights is focused on social data. So finding ways that we can actually blend in um, other sources of information is super helpful. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so again, just as an overview, Social Chain is a social media first marketing and advertising agency. We integrate um, data and insights uh, into all of our campaigns and social media marketing strategies. Um, and we've developed a flexible approach uh, to leverage social analytics um, to um, help our customers reach their target audiences more effectively. And I think, you know, Tim, you mentioned this at the beginning when you were um, going over um, your points. Uh, obviously, given the current situation with uh, coronavirus and, and everyone being on lockdown or quarantine or somehow changing the way they, they live their everyday lives, we're seeing human behavior change um, immeasurably. And uh, it's actually a great time for, for social media listening and analytics because People are spending so much more time on on social and relying on technology more than ever before. So we're really uh, kind of in a gold rush when it comes to being able to tap into and listen to people on social. Our, our methodology, when we think of blending together different types of social insights, is to put consumer understanding first and at the center of everything we do, but that's not all that we do at Social Chain. So we'll we'll oftentimes start by looking at the market and the, the category insights that we can glean from available secondary information, blend that together with um, search as well as social to gain deeper consumer understanding. And then we'll also blend that together with brand perspective. So oftentimes when we'll work with a client, they might be interested in understanding not just what their direct competitors are doing, but what best in class social companies and, and brands are doing to better understand emerging social and digital trends on the whole. I can talk about some of the tools that we use. So again, we remain completely data and resource agnostic. Um, I don't have, have SEMrush up here. We do occasionally use uh, SEMrush, but uh, we, we're constantly looking for different tools that we can make use of both from a um, just raw um, online and digital data perspective, as well as social. Um, we use everything from published research like Global Web Index to better understand our audiences to Tubular to look at um, video content and engagement rates for specific brands, and um, as well as general social media listening using tools like, like NetBase and CrowdTangle. But again, I think what's really important to take away from, from this is we are completely data agnostic. There are major players in the space when it comes to social listening. And I think anyone that's listening in today, um, you shouldn't necessarily be uh, completely um, sold by uh, the best in class players in the space. You should be constantly looking at um, startups and, and kind of more innovative, maybe a team of two that's building a tech solution that um, could give you the answers that you need. That's our, our approach is we do have some best in class tools and resources in our portfolio, but we're constantly looking to see what um, tools are out there um, to give us access to different social platforms, for instance, like like TikTok um, and, and others where APIs might not be completely available yet. So we've identified a lot of the research that we've been doing recently over the last two, two months now is focused on coronavirus and the different ways that consumers are engaging with 
content, engaging with brands, um, making purchase decisions, you know, as Tim mentioned before, um, and Fernando mentioned. So I think that we've identified right here, there's about 24 different trends, right around survival anxiety or um, time well spent. What, what does it mean to have a home office and homework balance when you're working from home constantly? And we've found that diving into some of these mega trends is actually really powerful right now to help guide our uh, brands that we work with to to develop more targeted social media marketing strategies. Um, so determining which channels are becoming more popular and where people are spending more time, but also the types of content that are really resonating with people in different segments and different categories. So I'm going to dive into three of these in a bit more detail and slow living, this idea of tech as a savior, and then also another one, which is probably pretty obvious to most of you, but this idea of direct to my door and personalization in the direct to my door world. Um, so the first one that I want to talk about is slow living and this idea that uh, people started off uh, in quarantine, in lockdown, in a lot of countries, uh, feeling a lot of anxiety and feeling a lot of negative sentiment when it came to um, feeling as if they were, were trapped, right? Um, a lot of uh, extroverts were were saying that they were literally climbing the walls uh, when we were looking at social media posts on on Reddit and Twitter and and Facebook, um, and trying to find ways that they could you know engage with others through pub uh, pub online pub quizzes and um, Zoom conversations, things of that nature. But what we really realized as well, and you can sort of start to see looking at this graph here on the left, is there was a lot of negative sentiment about quarantine, but there were also spikes of and continuous um, emphasis on the positive sides of lockdown and the fact that a lot of people now even looking two months into this this quarantine period or this lockdown period they're almost nostalgic about having to go back to work right so they're they're nostalgic about this period uh they're, they're seeing oh i can live and work from home do i need to go back to work so there's a lot of conversation there around what will the future of the workplace look like will it be working from home entirely and we've been able to use this information and drill down, obviously, in more depth to help guide content development for a few software as a service companies that are looking to grow their, their leads and, and, and also just expand their business, as well as a few consumer products brands that are looking to grow in that way. I mentioned this before. Obviously, tech platforms are extremely powerful um, for bringing people together during this time. And we, we blended together some data here from Google Trends, as well as um, uh, data that's freely available to anyone through Global Web Index. If you actually go and check out their website, they, they're offering the um, coronavirus data um, free uh, to anyone that, that uh, goes there. But as you can see from this, from the pink chart, that the two areas where people are spending significantly more time um, and during their day-to-day -day activities is spending time on social messaging apps and social media in general. Now, we're all, we also are seeing a massive spike in television as well as things like reading books and learning, uh, but that, that connection to social has become really important for us as we're trying to have conversations with brands about where they should be putting, putting their marketing emphasis. Uh, and, and you can see that in terms of the, the ways that people are communicating. And then finally, Again, this is something that might be obvious to a few of you, uh, but this idea that um, the dependence on deliveries and delivery food as well as delivery products has grown in um, interest as of late. And it's actually um, seeing a, a massive uplift in positivity, uh, whereas pre-COVID, we wouldn't have seen as much positivity around this idea of delivery. Um, people were complaining about late deliveries or complaining about not being able to get their deliveries in the window they, they agreed upon. But now, for instance, if you look at this top chart on the upper left-hand corner, you see general sentiment around coronavirus and you see how negative it is. And uh, yeah, it's a bit, a bit hard to see, but it's, you know, we're seeing negative 41% net sentiment for general conversation around coronavirus. But if you look below that at posts regarding delivery conversation, you see a positive, a net positive of 58% sentiment. So you're seeing that people that are actually talking about delivery in relation to coronavirus are extremely elated about the prospect of getting things delivered to their door. Um, people talking um, at length about how they love that a brewery that um, 
they loved in Manchester is now doing same day deliveries if you live in a certain postcode and will deliver within a few hours if you live in, in a in certain proximity to the to the brewery. So there's a lot of um, positive opportunities there for brands that may be looking to leverage delivery and talk about their added benefits of, of same day delivery um, as well. So there are three key takeaways that I want to run through um, off the back of some of the research that we've found and just in general in terms of how we approach data and insights. Number one, I think it's keeping social research human centered. So ultimately trying to keep the consumer or the citizen of whichever market you're, you're in um, at the center of your research rather than focusing too heavily on the creative um, content of competitors or on the market context as a whole. Be listening to the, those consumers and what they're saying. Um, embrace mixed methodologies. So I would continue to recommend looking for those new tools, talking to different um, social media analytic providers as much as possible to see what's happening in the world of um, unstructured text analysis and natural language processing because it's constantly changing and evolving. And also blending scientific rigor uh, with commercial value. So obviously we're we're in this context of this webinar we're trying to understand the science of marketing leveraging data, but how do you drive home some of these data points to allow um, a CEO or a founder of a brand of a company to actually drive growth um, through marketing decisions and, and decisions around spending. So thank you for that. I know it took a few more minutes, but I uh, really appreciate the time. Okay. Th thank you. Also, that, that's great. Obviously, there's some interesting insights to see what one of the largest agencies in terms of social media does uh, uh, from social chain point of view. And it's great to see that there isn't just one tool. Of course, uh, SEMrush is a great tool to see everything in, in one place. But uh, the key point that McLeod suggested that uh, no tool is perfect. And it's useful to see some of the new opportunities and new emerging tools that might give you that edge and a bit more different insight on this. So thank you very much, Mekwal, and thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for fantastic uh, presentations. Um, uh, we have a number of questions. The first question is from uh, Marco Schulter. Um, and uh, Marco's question is that it was reported that online e-commerce increase, I understand this happened only in March, beginning of April and went down then again after that. Is that correct? I think Fernando's got some data on that, but I think it, it depends on the sector. Um, so it's, yes. the, it's very, very heavily dependent on the sector. So I saw some which jumped up hugely. I think the I want to make a distinction between kind of search volume, interest to buy online, and what McBell finished with at the end is the ability to deliver. Stock levels have actually impacted how much money was made on those. So the decline uh, in revenues in April mostly seem to be linked to sectors which couldn't sell, so outdoor sporting goods, for example, and sectors which had low stocks, so hair clippers. Still huge demand for them, but the revenue coming in is really low at the moment because they don't have any left to sell. But I know Fernando Semrus had a study, didn't they, on search volumes, and it was very, very sector dependent on, on stuff. I've got a couple of clients who are doing record-breaking business at the moment right now. Fernando, would you like to add something to that? Oh, yes, definitely. Actually, we we have three research made on what is happening right now. Not on uh, only retail, but uh, only e-commerce retail. But uh, in every single industry, uh, we have some winners of this situation. Uh, e-commerce, of course, is, uh, is still up there uh, because the rest of the industry are not recovering yet. Um, but yes, you, you can enter just the, the semrush dot com slash blog, and we have uh, three research. The first one is based on the winners and losers. Uh, the second one is based how uh, COVID-19 trends uh, affected all the industries overall and how Google reacted to it. And the uh, third one is uh, the, the status uh, actually is from the last uh, last week, uh, how things are changing right now in terms of which are the players who are staying. Uh, E-commerce is going to be there. There are more and more uh, websites uh, being created. Actually, for us, was really surpri surprisingly that in terms of, of our own results, we are having more and more uh, e-commerce uh, clients, which is, of course, a fantastic situation for any vendor. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we have a, another question, and this is a question from uh, Mayo uh, and question for Stuart. Um, have you, um, Stuart, written articles? I'm sure you have, um, or papers on the topic that you presented today. 
a non-specific topic. I've done plenty of talking. My blog is quite technical and geeky, so it's not really on this subject, but I've done some work with sort of CXL. Um, so if you go to the CXL blog, um, they've got some articles from some very good um, experts in the industry, but also for I've, I've contributed a few to those. Uh, it really comes down to kind of, ultimately, we're still doing what we always used to, which is trying to deliver value to the end user. And if we provide a solution, they buy from us. If we do it well, they come back to us. That's become harder. So there are new techniques, new new ways to cope with that. But the general trends of kind of you know, identifying a problem, fixing a problem, people who do that well are the ones who've done well during this period. And so it may be that you have to change up how you do your business because your previous solution no longer fits the current climate. But the things that got you to that being a product in the first place could help you can the same process will take you back to being there so i don't have any specifically published on this one on the slides but uh, there's plenty of information out there and some good resources where, where you could read up on this sort of stuff the the process is fairly established thank you very much uh, for that tim um another question this is for fernando uh this is a question from uh, Katenia. Is it possible to combine qualitative information such as customer anecdotes verbal feedback from customers and employees Complaints and thank yous, and incorporate in data where that all the small essential details are not lost. Well, actually, um, th that information that you can uh, retrieve from different sources uh, are need to be um, uh, filled on a CRM. Uh, we are using a lo lot of them. Um, the thing is, how you're going to build that process? How we are doing it? We have our monitoring list. Uh, and we have a team that is working on on, on that. Uh, we have automated tools that are, are uh, o o um, also monitoring all the mentions, all the comments, the anecdotes, even the sarcasm that people have uh, on online. So we have these sentiment analysis tools. In SEMrush, we have our own sentiment analysis tools, but sometimes there are just so much information that you need to do it manually. So we are doing uh, that manually. We are retrieving all that, inform all that information. And of course, we are creating patterns. How um, sarcastic are the people? How, how the negative was that comment? And we are building blocks saying, this is the block of people who are uh, the, um, the ones who are supporting uh, us, or the, these ones are the retractors, right? If we are going uh, to, that, to, the, to that kind of workflows. Fantastic, Fernando. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, answer. And uh, another question, and uh, this is a question to all the panelists. And, and this is a question from Abdurrahman Mahmoud. How big data analytics can help different businesses respond to the impact of COVID-19 in this time of uncertainty and how to build short-term and long-term strategies? That's a small question. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll try and give one example because obviously big data is different definitions. Um, but we've got uh, McFarlane and Fernando have given some some indications in their talks about how large volumes of data and understanding the overall trends and patterns can give you some framework. I would suggest, particularly if you're looking at um, retail or e-commerce, we've got pockets of infection, we've got pockets of lockdown, and most of the analytics tools you've got will have a uh, location data. So I talked earlier about people evolving through their ability to cope. And actually, one of the things I've done, which is which has been a kind of side project, has been mapping how different locations have over time changed. Because we talk about the infection rate of a country, but actually even within that country, you've got local behavior. And as we unlock, that will be reversing. And so you can actually start to map and say, this area is further ahead in the curve. They are more likely to be the acceptance of dealing with new normal and therefore buying products that fit that. These IP addresses for these locations are further behind the curve. So when I talked earlier on about personas having to be flexible to what they had been previously, it's no longer Bob from accounting. Actually, we've got different levels of Bob in terms of where their experience is, what their behavior is, and their behavior patterns show you where they are and their location shows you where they physically are. And actually, if you cross map those two things together, you get some interesting correlations in terms of the purchase behaviors that are coming back now in areas which are lightening lockdown. One example I'd give you is the auto industry. We're talking about uh, e-commerce is booming. Car dealerships have not been able to sell, uh, have traditionally not had very good online purchase and delivery. But the demand for private cars is huge. Um, China in its unlock has gone from 34% car ownership to 60% car ownership because people don't want to be on public transport. And 
if you follow the patterns of where people are going, you could start to spot what types of cars they're going for, and you can make an estimate as to what available cash will be in the market because a car is not a small purchase. Whereas they may have made 15 journeys in a month on public transport, they're now going to be making other purchases and not being able to spend because they just spent several thousand pounds on a car. That's a very interesting response in terms of the, how the behaviour will change because of the uh, uh, the COVID-19 and also um, the consumer purchases behaviour. I have um, one more question, and this is a question for Macwal. Um You mentioned in your presentation about uh, deliveries and the trends in that and how that has changed in terms of people's attitude towards that. Do, do you think that it is likely that uh, after the lockdowns are eased around the world that the, um, the delivery expectations will be similar in terms of people's behaviour and expectations? Uh, you know, I think that we're all trying to know know and understand and predict what the, the new normal will be, um, you know, in, in three months' time, in six months' time, in 18 months' time. Uh, but I think that the... The businesses that are innovating in the delivery space, um, businesses like uh, there's a, a company called uh, Starship Technologies, I think, out of out of California, that's um, automating uh, delivery robots right now in the U.S. and in Milton Keynes in the U.K. Um, they're doing some really interesting things there with same day delivery. There are certain hiccups there where um, people are complaining about. Just the fact that um, the delivery sizes are very small for those those robots, um, but I think you know the standard um, DHL is is getting better at some of the things that they do, and and they're getting better uh, customer service reports um, just in the in this period uh, because I think people are more lenient. So I think um, consumer behavior and consumer um, uh, sentiment around that industry and around the logistics industry as a whole is changing. I think um, people used to think of it as a pain, but they're seeing it as a, a lifesaver right now. So I wouldn't be surprised just on the whole if we see more positive sentiment around delivery and more people opting to receive delivery packages more frequently simply because they know it's it's fairly seamless and they don't, you know, they, they may decide to purchase something and they know they don't need it for, for one or two days. Um, it'll be an easier decision to make. Uh, but I'm not a a, a fortune teller, so I, I can't 100% guarantee that. So this is a question for Fernando, um, a question for Marina. How effective would redirecting from social media to the website impact bank clicking and SEO? Well, if we are talking about you want to have better rankings, uh, there is nothing proof out there that uh, having those links will, will affect you. Actually, uh, some search engines as Google are not taking account of them in general. But, um, and these are rumors, right? There are social, social signals. If you have your, uh, your, your profiles with the links to your, uh, to your web page, of course, that counts as a, as a backlink, right? A link is a link, w w whatever it is. But if you want to rank uh, higher with those backlinks, maybe that's not the right choice. But still, it's good to have your, uh, the links to your website uh, anywhere, as many as, uh, as, as you want. But for ranks, maybe that's that's not going to be the situation. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that question and, and response, Fernando. Um, that's uh, all I have, Alexi, at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tahir, and thank you for all the, uh, the responses. I just want to thank every one of our panelists. Obviously, I appreciate everybody's busy and uh, giving up your lunchtime today to share your insights is really valuable for us. We will be uh, making a recording of this session available and uh, hopefully uh, those who have not been able to attend will be able to benefit from this. Just as a final thank you, this is our third uh, session for to launch the book. Anybody who wants to get a copy, using the code SSM20 gets the 20% discount. And apart from this, I'm wishing you all the, the best of luck in terms of the uh, deconfinement and um, do hope that you are keeping safe and uh, enjoy the interesting things that uh, the world of digital marketing sends at us <laughs> in the coming months. Thank you very much to our panelists. And uh, again, thank you to the here for uh, fielding the questions. Mm -hmm.